Warning, the following video was recorded with a functioning webcam that didn't freeze during the recording session, so there will be a face cam during the entirety of the video. It should also be noted that the reactor you are currently watching has its own Five Nights at Freddy's theory, just like everyone and the grandmother. Please refer to the description of this video if you wish to know what his initial theory was, just to see the look on his face when he's thoroughly proven wrong. And of course, enjoy the video. There's gotta be a code to open this. Bite of 87. You text? I, I must be close! Incident of 83. One movie! 11 animatronics, 11 kids! One phone guy, one killer! Hex code for purple backwards! Is that Markiplier? Yes, Matt Pat, who's me? Who's me? <laughs> That's no theory. <laughs> if only. Let's get right into this, shall we? Hello, Internet! Welcome to the Five Nights at Freddy's okay. podcast. Oh, uh, sorry, I, I mean Game Theory. G game Theory! The, the show that covers <laughs> theories on other games in the two-week intervals between new installments of FNAF. But if I'm ever gonna see requests for games other than FNAF 4 in my Twitter feed, this video needed to be made. Because, I have a confession, Internet, I made a mistake. <gasps> in my last FNAF video. Not my research, mind you. My conclusion that this kid scientifically could not be the Bite of 87 victim was actually 100% right, both scientifically and, as you've been eager to point out, lore-wise. No, I was wrong in calling this the Bite of 87. I'm mad enough to admit my mistakes. Hey, it's why they're called theories after all, right? Anyway, in this case, Scott was sure to let me know my error in his first comment on any of my videos on the franchise to my knowledge, which was really exciting, but it did leave me wondering, should I feel honored or trolled? And let me just say, because you were asking, I didn't delete that comment. I only delete comments from game theorist bots. No, I don't want your free PSN codes, okay? <laughs> so I guess Scott must have deleted it himself. Maybe there was a typo. Or maybe a clue to FNAF 5. But before no. I get that far ahead, let's close the book on FNAF 4. First, let's set the record straight on where it takes place. It does not take place in Fredbear Family Diner, but rather the first location of Freddy Fazbear's Pizza, the one from the old phone guy tapes found in FNAF 3. But the Springlock yellow suits are the only ones there, I hear you typing. You're right, they obviously are. But remember, Phone Guy's tapes in FNAF 3 welcome you to Freddy Fazbear's Pizza, not Fredbear Diner, before he tells you about their, quote, specially designed suits. Yep. Hold that cassette tape. Welcome to your new career as a performer slash entertainer for Freddy Fazbear's Pizza. Right now, we have two specially designed suits that double as both animatronic and suit. Specially designed, i.e. not in existence during the Fredbear era. Plus, in that same set of phone calls, Phone Guy tells us the suits have become decommissioned after an incident where there were, quote, multiple simultaneous springlock failures. What do we see at the end of FNAF 4? An incident where multiple springlocks fail simultaneously and a child dies. And let me be clear, because the terminology is pretty confusing. In the game, the word springlock is used to describe both the suit as a whole and the individual locking mechanisms within that suit. A springlock suit is made up of multiple springlocks. To have multiple mm -hmm. simultaneous springlock failures, like Phone Guy says, would either mean multiple suits going down at the same time, which is a bit coincidental and hard to believe, or that multiple locks within the same suit collapse at the same time, causing a catastrophic failure. Say, for instance, that is nasty. the child is squirming to escape, and his tears are moistening the locks. Oh. And besides, don't you think it'd be weird for Fred that makes so much to sense. suits, have them kill a child, sell the company, and then Freddy Fazbear's Pizza starts using them again? It just wouldn't make a lot of sense. Long story long, although Fredbear and Springtrap are the featured attractions at this restaurant, this is 
a Freddy Fazbear branded joint. One dating back to, as we see on the TV set, 1983. But enough about the timeline, I don't want to dwell on it in this episode. To me, having a general placement of the timeline is enough, because the most interesting part of this game is the ending, and its overall meaning. That's what I like I said know. in the other FNAF 4 video, if this was just a random kid who got bit, that would be really lame. So how does this particular kid fit into the overall lore? Why is this incident of 1983 so important to show? Who is the FNAF 4 kid, and what does the ending line of, I will put you back together, mean? Well, let me tell you, the evidence points to him being the puppet. Let's look at the evidence. First, many have pointed what? out the streaming tears down the kid's face, which yeah. mimic the tears down the puppet's mask. Okay, sure, that was good evidence when we first saw them in FNAF 2, but at this point, those nice pixelated streams are on nearly every chubby-cheeked kid who's ever entered these restaurants. So alone, it's not much to go on. But we can take it one step further. While the tears themselves might not be interesting, look at this. It's a screen from the Mangle minigame back in FNAF 3. Whoa. This weird, crying, giant silhouette was just kind of out of place that in the thing last before. Game. And all us FNAF theorists just kind of glossed over it in our analyses since, seriously, what is it? I mean, it kind of looks like the puppet, right? With its overall fabric feel and its thin striped legs. I mean, that's what I thought at the time, but again, there was really no reason to bring it up since it just didn't fit anywhere. But now we have a new game and new information that might make this make sense. Look at its body position. Notice anything specific about it? It resembles a position we see our FNAF 4 kid in a lot throughout the game, oh, including man. his final scene, kneeling down, two streaming tear tracks, and his face turned two-thirds toward the camera. Do you see the connection here? But not only that, look at what our kid wears. A black and gray striped shirt. And remember, yes. this is in a world where all the other kids are generally wearing single color outfits. It's an oddly specific detail. Now I ask you, what's the signature look for the puppet? None other than black and white stripes. But besides those design details, consider that there's no sign of the puppet anywhere in this game, and yet practically Every other animatronic is present in some form, meaning that this game likely exists at a time when the puppet has yet to be created. Remember when he just kind of showed up in FNAF 2? Which, I should remind you, takes place four years later than this game. He just kind of came out of nowhere. Uh -huh. Well, this could be the puppet's origin story. This idea of kid as puppet also works really well with the locked box at the end. What's in there besides Markiplier's stunning face and buttery voice? A puppet. As we see in FNAF 2, he has a habit of coming out of boxes, and he's the only one who can bend and fold up into a space yep. that's small. But there's even more evidence when you look at the timeline. Now, I challenge you to ask yourself one question. What exactly is the child afraid of in this game? Why does he hate this restaurant so much? The easy answer would seem to be the animatronics, but that'd be wrong. It's important to note that at the time of the cutscene minigames, he's not scared of Freddy, Bonnie, and Chica. When you walk over the pile of plushies in the corner, we see that he considers these characters as his friends. Foxy is kinda in that camp too, but to a slightly lesser degree because his brother has started scaring him with the Foxy mask, hence the head being pulled off. Even the weird psychic friend Fredbear isn't a scary presence for him. So clearly he's not scared of the characters. Is he scared of the people working at the restaurant? The purple guy? Maybe, but that's not quite the full answer either. Again, watch how he behaves. When trying to escape the worker in the Fredbear outfit, he can't muster the courage to run past the the show stage with the yellow suits. He collapses in fear. And when the bullies drag him over to the stage, he's freaking out. Clearly, what he is specifically afraid of in this restaurant this is the yellow springtrap suits, whether in animatronic mode or suit mode, which begs one question. Why? Why? The answer lies in psychic friend Fredbear. Look at the dialogue running through the kid's head. Hurry the other way and find someone who will help you know what happens if he catches you. That line would be easy to write off as this just being a scared kid who believes the ghost stories he's heard from the dead-eyed girl he talks to on the way home. She's creepy. <laughs> it wasn't for one thing, this other line. No. Don't you remember what you saw? This kid actually saw something. A crime. Something terrible in these restaurants. It would seem to imply that he saw another child get shoved into one of these suits. This would also explain the strange brown pixels sticking out of the yellow body backstage. Oh God. A tuft of hair, perhaps? All of these details also fit with the character I've been lovingly calling psychic friend Fredbear. He's here, he's there, he's everywhere. Who, Who are you gonna, gonna call? call? 
Psychic friend, friend, bear. Oh, that just killed it. I mean, seriously, what is this thing? Sometimes he's a bear, sometimes he's referencing it, and sometimes he's... A uh, flower? Uh, okay. At first, it seemed like the creepy little toy was nothing but an imaginary friend. That was until the final moments, after the bite, when we see the bear's signature yellow text. But this time, instead of parroting back the kid's feelings like he usually does, he shows that he is clearly in possession of a mind of his own, saying all kinds of creepy things like, You're broken. We're still your friends. Don't you believe that? And I'm still here. I will put you back together. This isn't just a split personality of the kid or anything. This is a separate entity. This is a spirit. This is someone who knows the danger of getting caught by the people wearing those suits. This is the victim that our FNAF 4 kid saw getting stuffed. This is Golden Freddy. Purple Guy's first victim. And I know you're rushing into the comments now to say that this changes a lot of things and goes against stuff we've been saying for a while. But don't worry, we'll address it. Just get excited! We've pinpointed the identities of our two most mysterious animatronics! This is an awesome revelation from an evidence standpoint. Oh my god! Honest, it's a little disappointing from a storytelling standpoint. Here's why. We humans all have a proven psychological need to complete things. This need is called, unimaginatively, the completion principle. We want to fill in the blanks in the stuff around us so that the world makes sense and we feel in control. It's the biggest psychological reason why you want to beat a game, or even just an individual level. You know how you just can't stop and save in the middle of a level? You have to play until it's done. This is the reason why. Weirdly enough, it's even the reason why it's so hard to leave just one slice of cake outside of sheer deliciousness, or leave out the last two pieces of a puzzle. I mean, even just looking at it on the screen, Earl, just put the piece in! Just finish the last two pi- Just animate the pieces to move over into the open slots and I beg you, just finish the last- Oh, thank you. This isn't just you being, OMG, I'm so OCD. It's actually because the brain is wired to respond to knowing when you're done with a task. The brain can now take the mental energy it was using to focus on that activity and use it on something else. But what happens if you don't finish that piece of cake? Or if you walk away from a game right before beating the level? Your brain can't put that activity away because it's still not finished. You literally continue to spend mental energy on it in the background, even when you're doing other things. As long as there are unknowns, your brain can't feel that in total so control much sense. and can't let things go. And whether he knew this when creating the first FNAF game or not, Scott Cawthon has done an amazing and infuriating job of creating a story that looks like it goes one way, but also looks like it might go somewhere else. This keeps us thinking about FNAF lore, talking about FNAF lore, pestering our favorite YouTube theorists for more FNAF lore for weeks. Months. <laughs> Watching every video released on everything from top 10 details you missed in the FNAF 4 teaser to top 10 facts about the cupcake. The really? cupcake! 10 facts about the cupcake. How do you find Seriously. 10 facts? Once about that we're thing. into the lore, our brains literally cannot let the pieces go until there's some kind of resolution, a completed story. But Scott has done such a good job of keeping the game in flux that the pieces never quite feel like they fit in a way that feels satisfying. We never get that moment of R O L A I D S. That spells relief. So we want the pieces of the puzzle to fit together cleanly, and the problem with FNAF is that while there's plenty of evidence for the story to go one way, there's also evidence for it going somewhere else. Try this one on for size. Well, there's a lot of evidence for the kid in FNAF 4 being the puppet, and I'd bet my bottom dollar that that's the solution that Scott intended. From a storytelling standpoint, more pieces actually fit together if the FNAF 4 kid becomes Golden Freddy and not the puppet. This would make our first victim, what? the one our FNAF 4 kid sees get killed, the puppet, like we've been hypothesizing since FNAF 2. Suddenly, you have a group of five kids celebrating a birthday, one kid associated with each animatronic, with the one representing Golden Freddy being the odd man out. And this scenario perfectly mimics the FNAF 3 good ending with the happiest day oh mini my game, God. where five souls from five kids, each representing a different animatronic, reunite to celebrate a birthday that never really happened. It actually creates a beautifully bookended story of redemption and forgiveness, a reunion of brothers. 
And yeah, yeah, I know the complaints. Don't get me started about the size of the kids being different. They're the spirits of dead children in an 8-bit minigame, okay? Literalizing the sizes seems to be a bit of a stretch. And it goes even further than that. In the FNAF 2 Give Gifts minigame, the puppet gives life to the dead children, with Golden Freddy as the odd man out who doesn't get a mask and does a ghostly jump scare at the end. That would reflect the four bullies getting killed in the pizzeria by Purple Guy in response to this incident, while the one, Golden Freddy, dies somewhere else. Like, a hospital bed. I mean, we do see the IV and pills and flowers, and as a result, that's why the puppet, the first victim, is able to reach those four kids' souls and save them, while Golden Freddy has to behave like a ghost. It also gels with the idea that the Take Cake minigame represents the first victim at the first location, and why the puppet is always the jump scare, because he's the kid we've just watched get killed. So a lot of storytelling oh pieces God. fit together, but at the end of the day, that leaves us with too many questions about why Golden Freddy Freddy is talking to our FNAF 4 kid. A spirit needs to be inhabiting that bear for the story to make sense. And Scott certainly put in plenty of evidence that leads us to believe that the FNAF 4 kid is the puppet. The FNAF 4 kid needs to have seen a tragic, scary incident to make him fear the restaurant, which means he can't have been the first kid to have been killed. In short, the challenge here is that you have a choice. There's more evidence for our FNAF 4 kid becoming the puppet. But the resulting story is more satisfying for him to become Golden Freddy. And either side leaves you wanting more, because not all the evidence works in either scenario. And that is the true secret to FNAF. The completion principle demands that we get answers, that the scraps of evidence across the four games come together cleanly, but if and when they do, our brains will just be able to move on and forget about it, making it just another game that we played and is collecting dust on our shelf, or taking up memory space in our Steam account, I guess. In the meantime, good on Scott for making sure FNAF is always on our minds. He didn't do it by giving us endless levels or a whole bunch of stuff to complete. He did it just by making sure the pieces starving. that are there are never quite enough. So GG, Scott. GG. And GG to all of you too, theorists. All of us. For trying to complete the story and solve the mysteries. I may complain about it, but honestly, I've been having a blast. It's like the gravity falls of video games. It's been my honor to work with all of you on this quest over the last year, and I look forward to trying to continue the quest in the year to come. In fact, since this has been a video many of you have been waiting for for a long time, now that it's finally out, this Thursday at 4 o'clock p.m. Pacific time, I'll be live streaming right here on the Game Theorist channel, answering all the remaining questions you have about the FNAF franchise, touching on things I didn't get to cover in this episode, like the presence of Mangle in FNAF yeah, 4, that never made while sense also looking me. at some of the theories that you've been submitting to me over the last year. So if you have a question you want answered or a theory you want addressed, between now and Thursday at 4 o'clock p.m. PST, tweet me at MattPatGT with the hashtag GTLive. It just helps me sort things. I'll be reading your burning questions and answering them to the best of my ability. Ability. And who knows, we may even be able to get a special guest or two in here. So remember, that's right here on the Ooh. Game Theorist channel, Thursday at 4 o'clock p.m. Pacific Time. And to get you ready, welcome back to the Super Amazing End Card Tournament, <laughs> where I want to know, do you think the FNAF 4 kid is the puppet or Golden Freddy? Simple as that, you've heard the arguments for both sides. Click on one to choose, I'll let you know which side won on Thursday's live stream, and it'll all be our way of letting Scott know how we want this story to take shape. But remember, Remember, that's just a theory. A game theory. Thanks for watching. He's here, he's there, he's everywhere. Who are you gonna call? Psychic friend Fred Bear. I like switch keys at the end. It's weird. Psychic friend Fred. Psychic friend Fred Bear. That's it. He's here, he... He's here, he's there, he's Ooh, everywhere. Who are you gonna call? Worthy. Psychic friend Fred Bear. That wasn't it either. Damn. He's here, he's there. <laughs> this is great. Uh, he's here, he's oh there, God, he's this everywhere. Is... Who are you gonna call? Psyche friend, Fred Bear. That was it. That was a bit cringeworthy, but... <sighs> I am like... I don't really know at this point. I mean, let's be honest. Like he said, it can go either way. It can be... He can be the puppet, he can be Golden Freddy, <laughs> he could be Mangle for all we know, but, and we still have, like, the Halloween DLC to come out, or what, whatever's coming out, and we still need those two keys to open up that one box.
That holds all the secrets that we've been looking for. Man. I know this is a big change of pace of what I've usually been posting as far as reaction videos and everything, but honestly, I needed to know this stuff and just the pure shock on my face that I was probably displaying most likely worth it. So, I'd like to hear your guys' theories down below in the comments. Uh, I'd like to drum up those kinds of discussions with you, so if you got any, feel free to leave them in the comments below. Leave a like, follow me on Twitter, do all that stuff. I really appreciate it. So, I will see you guys in the next video.